Okay, we're ready to go, everyone. So um, welcome. On sunny morning, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. The clerk has confirmed we've got quorum, and uh, we're going to start with the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Chair. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Okay, any, um, thank you very much, Chris Ann. Is there any declarations of uh, conflict of interest? I don't see any, I'm gonna move on to the approval of the minutes. Could I have um, someone approve the minutes? Robert. Commissioner Lalonde, thank you. All those in favor? That carries. Okay, as always, um, I want to remind you this is an open meeting. I want to also um, remind you that if you have, if you would, if you would like to speak or ask questions, to email um, our clerk, Chris Ann, and let her know, and she'll um, put you in the queue for a five minute uh, period of questioning or speaking. And um, if you have any troubleshooting uh, or you need us to troubleshoot for any technical issues, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to help you with those things. There's uh, been lots of the, that of late. Um, we'll recess uh, at one o'clock for lunch. Um, if we get if we get there, we may not. So I'm going to start by um, reviewing the order paper. And once that's complete, um, we can move adoption of some of the items that aren't uh, that are not held. So um, the CEO report, uh, I will hold that in my name because we have a presentation from the CEO as usual. Um, approval of the minutes, uh, I'll hold that in my name as well uh, because we'll have a report from the ACAT chair. Number three is Bloor Young Capacity Improvements Main Construction Property Acquisition Authorization. Would anybody like to hold that? I'm just going to go through the Hollywood squares here. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to not hold that. Okay, Wheel Trans Transformation Program. I will hold in my name because we have deputations and a staff presentation on that item. Uh, number five is um, presentation of SAP program update. Um, again, we have a staff presentation, so I'll hold that in my name. Um, procurement authorization is item six, supply of mobile climate control parts. I'm going to look and see if anybody would like to hold that. I don't see anybody, so I'm going to uh, put that aside. Easier access design services contract, the procurement amendment authorization. Anybody want to hold that? Okay, I don't see anybody. Oh, I guess, should we move these as we're going through, Chris Ann? I guess so. Or just can, do it at the end. We can move a motion at the end. Okay, that, that's, that's faster. 4800 Young Street, new entrance connection. Any questions on that? It's kind of exciting because it's well, it's much needed if you've ever been at at Young and Shepherd. Um, any any questions? Yes, Fenton's agreeing with me. Okay, so it's a bit of a mess, but this is going to improve it. Okay, so that's good news. No questions on that one. Uh, financial update for the period ended May first, twenty twenty one, and major project updates. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Osborne, we're going to hold that in your name. That item, item ten, is KPMG. Uh, audit findings report. Um, you know, the, the, this is the consolidated financial statements for this uh, for this year, tw the year 2020. And it, would anybody like to hold that item? No. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, draft. This is item 11. Draft consolidated financial statements of the TTC uh, ending this uh, 2020. No, nobody sure. on that. I just advise that the audit committee has reviewed items 10, 11, and 12 and recommended them for approval of the board. Okay, so do you want to move those those items now, uh, Commissioner Lalonde? I'd be happy 10, to. 10, 11, and 12? Okay. Do we have to, can we do them, uh, all three, Chris Ann, or? Yes, Chair, bundle them? Fine. 
Okay, so we're bundling 10, 11, 12. Commissioner Lalonde is moving those items all in favor. That's approved. Uh, against, I'm assuming nobody. Okay, and that's approved. Okay, so that's done. 13, TTC pension uh, plan, the bylaw amendments. Anyone want to discuss that or questions? Uh, TTC plan, pension plan annual report. Okay, and then uh, 15 is the kind of the added item, the Osgood interlocking incident report. Uh, I will definitely be holding this and we're actually um, proposing that we deal with this as the first item of business. But before moving to that, um, I would like to go back to the items um, that we've uh, gone by. So item three, uh, which is Bory Young, Item six, procurement authorization. Item seven, easier access design. Item eight, 4800 Young Street. Um, those items and uh, are the only items we haven't um, dealt with. So if I could get a motion to deal with those. Oh, chair, those, sorry. It's yeah. Kristen, um, and items 13 and 14 as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's add, Three, let's add six, 13 seven, and 14. Eight. Yeah, 13, 14. Okay, yeah, let's add 13 and 14. I see, saw Commissioner uh, Lai's hand up. So th those are moved and all in favor of those items. That is approved, All nobody was against. Okay, good. So uh, that dispenses of a number of items. Um, so we'll go back to the regular agenda and uh, it's been requested that we move 15 to the top and we go in camera. I think there's gonna be some opening remarks from the CEO, and then we'll go in camera um, for this item. So I will pass it over to uh, Rick Leary. Okay, thank you, Chair Robinson. Okay, commissioners, uh, as you were aware, in June of last year, we had an operational incident near our Osgood station that resulted in two trains coming much closer to each other while in revenue service than they should have. This is what we have been known as a near miss. I wanna be clear that although this incident had no impact on service and there were no in injuries or damage to our infrastructure, it should never have happened. Under confidential cover, I provided you with a copy of a third party review that we initiated. But before we engage in a discussion on that report, I wanna give you as well as members of the public a brief overview of what actually happened that night and what we did when we learned of the incident. By now, I'm sure everyone has heard me say repeatedly that safety is paramount to all that we do here at the TTC. It's something that we'll never compromise on and it's something that we're always looking to improve. With respects to the event of uh, June 12, 2020, our plan was always to include the details of it as part of a broader report to you on the subway operations in this coming September. However, in the interest of transparency, I thought it was important to bring it before you today at this meeting. I do wanna let members of the public know that the report that we're presenting to the board today is confidential because it contains information related to arbitration and litigation. However, again, in the interest of transparency, we're posting a version of the third party review on our website as part of today's agenda. Due to the arbitration, we did have to remove certain sections, removing, including removing names of the individuals involved. I first wanna give you an overview of the incident in question and the facts as we know them. Shortly after midnight on June 12, 2020, an emergency alarm, or the EA as we've referred to to you, was activated on a train northbound at St. Andrews Station. As a practice, that train was held at the station. Now with EAs, we never know how serious they are right away or how long they might impact our service. So the decision was made to modify regular service and turn a southbound train back at Osgood Station. Now this is a very common practice, and you'll hear more about that shortly as a means of uh, mitigating delays and keeping service moving. In this case, the southbound train was instructed to offload its customers at Osgood Station and enter the pocket track south of Osgood Station. We call it a turn back location. This train would then re-enter service northbound. Yet in the meantime, the EA cleared and the train that was holding at St. Andrew was released to continue northbound. At the same time, the train that was turning back slowly moved the exit from the pocket without authorization. That train came within a meter of the main line and the approaching train passed without incident. 
our safety staff working with the operations team launched a review, including interviewing staff and retrieving audio and video recordings. Subsequent to that, we initiated an outside review. Now, those two reviews resulted in a number of action items that were already have underway. As well, there will be a second phase to the external review, and we will report on our progress on our corrective actions and the hazard identification to you. So once again, I want to assure everybody that the TTC treats safety uh, as a number one priority and that our system is safe. Every day, thousands of buses and streetcars and subway trains traverse our roads, tracks, and tunnels within the city without incident. But of course, we do not take our safety for granted, which is why this incident has been treated so seriously. Although there, uh, this was a case of human error, I am committed to making changes to improve our processes and modernize our system with things like automatic train control. Now, ATC will not only improve our safety and minimize human error, it will also help our system become more reliable and more punctual. So those are my comments, uh, Chair. I will remind everyone, though, that uh, because of litigation and arbitration, we will have to move into private session for a deeper discussion, and I'll introduce that when we get into uh, private session. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And so I think we will do that now. Uh, so I need a motion to move in camera. I could have a motion to move into camera on this item. Uh, Councillor Lai, Commissioner Lai, uh, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. And we will move into private confidential session at this time. Um, uh, how long will that take, uh, Chris Ann, to? Do, we, do you need a couple minutes or? Just a few minutes, Chair. Thank you. Okay. The TTC board is meeting in confidential session. The meeting will resume shortly. Um, if I can ask the clerk to see if we have quorum. My chair confirming that we do have quorum. Okay. Very much. Okay, welcome back. We've now come out of closed session back into public session. And I'm just going to um, just clarify the agenda. So the items that are remaining are item one, the CEO report, item two, the ACAT report, item four, uh, wheel trans, which we have deputations on and a staff presentation. Item five, uh, the SAP program update, and there's a staff presentation on that. And uh, lastly, item nine, a uh, financial update, and Commissioner Osborne has held that item. So that's what we have uh, coming up, but we are going to move first to the item that we just discussed in closed session which is item 15, Osgood Interlocking Incident Report. And um, this, this item has been uh, discussed in closed session. We are now moving to public session on this item. 
And um, I would like to ask uh, the commissioners if there's any questions on this item. Not seeing any, uh, and I'm not seeing anybody text me, so I'm assuming that there's no questions. If not, um, wave madly, and it doesn't look like there are. Okay, so uh, there are no questions on this item, so we're going to move to speakers on this item, item 15. Okay, so we have uh, C Commissioner McKelvey will speak first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a motion. Okay, if we can get it up there. Thanks. Uh, that TTC staff deliver a public presentation on the Osgood interlocking incident at the July 7th, 2021 board meeting. Um, without, without discussing everything that, that happened in the confidential session, I think we'll, we'll hear it all again at the next meeting. And I think that we should have that discussion in the public forum. Um, there was a thorough investigation. I think it's important that the public hears about the investigative process that the TTC uses uh, so that it retains their confidence in, in their operations. Um, I have confidence in their operations following what we heard. Um, also discussed are the corrective actions that have been taken, and I think that that should also be on the public record. So I welcome hearing a presentation, video, audio, um, about the incident at the next meeting in, in public so that uh, everybody has full access to the information that we do. Commissioner McKelvey, are there any questions on the mover of the motion? Is there any questions from the board on the mover of the motions of the motion? Thank you very much. I don't see any. Okay, other speakers on this item? Sorry, I don't know if anybody's got their hand up here. Okay, I also have a motion, um, which I will move at this time, if that's okay, or if anybody else wants to jump in, feel free. Um, so uh, the item is before you, and basically this is to ensure that once we meet certain thresholds, um, which we heard from um, earlier today, that um, we basically have a report out to the board and in an immediate fashion so that we're completely um, in the loop uh, and advised of any of these incidences um, as quickly as possible. So um, we heard earlier uh, Kristen, Kirsten talk about the thresholds and um, basically this motion is ensuring that the CEO alerts the board when there's an incident uh, meeting these identified thresholds uh, for escalation and a subsequent report to the board once a comprehensive review or investigation has been completed. So um, that's, uh, I think, um, a motion that will help us as we move into the future and um, deal with this issue. Um, I want to thank uh, staff for the comprehensive report, reporting out on this um, as of today and uh, the, their thorough approach uh, to ensuring confidence for the riders of the TTC. I also want to thank um, Commissioner McKelvey for putting forward that motion. I think it's very important as an agency that we're as transparent as possible about these issues. The public, this is a public system and the public need to be assured uh, of the protocols and um, certainly what transpired as well as the um, go forward plan and, and the training, et cetera, that will be instituted, um, although it was already in place. But uh, we've heard over and over again, this was human error. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm sorry that the union uh, sent in a letter, but aren't here because I would have liked to ask them questions about their letters, letter today. Um, but uh, I am asking the CEO to respond to the union and to clarify the record on um, some of the things that were identified in that letter. So we're hoping that will happen today so that we, you know, the, the public's clear on uh, what transpired or the things that can be in public, public in the public domain at this time. So um, again, I wanna thank staff for their um, detailed presentation. 
and I hope you'll support this motion that so going forward, we get information sooner on these incidences and we can address, uh, you know, the mistakes that were made in a comprehensive manner with a, with a plan. And uh, that's all in place now. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other speakers on this item? Otherwise, we'll, we'll move to the moving of the motions. I just can't see everybody in the one, on the one thing. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. I don't think I am. Okay. All right. So let's um, let's move these motions in order of uh, presentation. So if we could do Co Commissioner McKelvey's first. All right. So all those in favor, opposed, that carries. And I think that was unanimous, unless I'm wrong. And then um, the other motion for myself about the thresholds and reporting out in a timely fashion. Um, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, that's great. Thank you, everyone. So we're gonna move on to our next chair. item in, sorry, go ahead. Uh, chair, item as amended, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I always forget that. Uh, item as amended, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, now we're done. With, we've uh, finished with item 15. We're gonna move to item one, which is usually our first item typically, and that is the CEO's report. I'll turn it over to Rick Larry. Yeah, thank you, Chair Robinson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our YouTube viewers, as well as today's participants in the board's virtual uh, meeting. Now, as you know, May was Asian Heritage Month, and within the TTC, we highlighted employees of Asian descent who shared their stories and experiences in the workplace, as well as the significance of the month as it is to them. We also supported the Toronto and Re in region chapter of the Conference of Minority Transit Officials, which held an important panel discussion addressing the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes in our society. This month, <clears throat> excuse me, this month, the TTC is proud to recognize National Indigenous History Month as well as Pride. It's an opportunity for us to uh, appreciate the history and heritage and diversity of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples through various initiatives taking place this month. And what you can see on the screen is a photo of one of the five streetcars wrapped with the land acknowledgement. You know, have you seen this bus yet? It, uh, it's our Pride bus and it's been uh, proudly serving the route 94 Wellesley uh, route during the Pride Month, and it, uh, this has been going on now for a dozen plus years. Next, Commissioners, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to recognize our longtime Chief People Officer, Gemma Piamontes, who will be retiring in the end of June. Gemma has served with the TTC for nearly 40 years. Gemma began her career at the TTC in 1982. She worked in service planning and engineering, as well as construction, before joining Human Room Resources in 1989. She held increasingly senior roles in employee relations, occupational health, as well as claims management and placement services before being promoted to the head of HR in 2012. After a reorganization of the departments uh, formed the new people group several years later, Gemma was promoted to the chief people officer. So we're celebrating Gemma's distinguished career virtually later this month until we can all get together to salute Gemma's immense contributions in person. So we look forward to that. So just be on behalf of the TTC executive and all employees, I'd like to say congratulations, Gemma, on a very distinguished career and best wishes in a long and fulfilling retirement. You can't go anywhere in this organization and any part of the organization with Gemma Piamontes without someone coming up to say hello to her. It's, it, uh, She's got a great reputation, so thank you, Gemma, for that. Job well done. Commissioners, I'd also like to turn your attention to the CEO's report and the fact that we've seen a rise in employee assaults. The TTC workforce, frontliners especially, have been through a lot these past 15 months, and we know they continue to face ongoing challenges. We've had seen an uptick in assaults of various kinds, and I can tell you that we here at the TTC take this incredibly seriously. I want to publicly and categorically say that employee safety and security is our highest priority. The TTC has a zero tolerance for abuse faced by our workers. 
TTC legal department has worked very hard over the years to strengthen federal legislation to support public transit operators. Most recently, we assembled an internal working group made up of staff from our legal operations, people, strategy, and customer experience group, along with communications, in order to create, to create an action plan. I've also been in discussions with both the city manager, Toronto city manager, Chris Murray, as well as uh, the police chief, James Raymer, to see what we can do together to support our employees. Chief Raymer has uh, confirmed that police officers are being asked to increase their presence on TTC properties and vehicles where possible to help increase the safety of both our drivers and our customers. I'd also let you know that we're uh, in the process of finalizing a communications campaign reinforcing this message to everyone who takes, the, takes our system. So I just want to say thank you to the city as well as TPS for their support on this very important matter. I'd also like to make you aware that elevators were recently put in service at Kale Station, making it a 53rd accessible station in our subway system. So job well done to our construction staff. It's proud to see more and more stations become accessible. Now on another bright note, uh, we have been pleased with the pop-up, uh, the COVID-19 vaccination clinics that we've held at various locations around TTC properties, and it allowed frontline transit workers to receive, and others, to re receive their first shot. You know, prior to these clinics, we, had, uh, we knew that almost 90% of TTC employees had already qualified for a vaccination because of their age and or address. To date, roughly 1,900 employees have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccination at our pop-up clinics. We are currently also in the process of reaching out to the hospitals and all the health providers to talk about the possibility of holding additional pop-up clinics even for the second dose when it becomes available. And just finally, uh, Chair and Board Commissioners, you know, June 21st is the first day of summer, so I'd like to wish uh, everyone a great and safe uh, start to the summertime. And Chair, that, uh, that concludes my, my remarks. Jay? Okay, sorry. Um, questions? I saw that Com Commissioner Lai has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, I just have a quick question on uh, there's going to be a planned communication campaign uh, in your report. Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of communication? Uh, how are you going to communicate to customers who have a uh, language barrier? Are, are you considering that they will be in different uh, languages, multiple languages in some of these campaigns? What are, what is the plan? Now, are you on that you could talk about that? Because we've been talking about all our campaigns being up to, I think there's 11 or 12 different languages around the city. Do you have right. that, uh, the specifics for me? Absolutely. Uh, and through the chair to Commissioner Lai, um, we, this was the first year that we created a communication strategy for diversity and uh, thankfully uh, Keisha is now part of our executive. We are working together to ensure that all of our uh, wonderful celebrations are recognized and to ensure that going forward in 2022 that uh, we have more wrapped buses and, and, and more distinction. We've had some really great luck this year. Um, uh, for uh, May with uh, Asian Heritage Month, we had Compto have a panel discussion with Leslie Wu and uh, and uh, some of our great folks around uh, Toronto that went very well. We had 130 TTC members watching that, as well as uh, we did a highlight amplifying the importance uh, in our TTC Weekly with one of our own uh, folks, uh, Lee Chow, who uh, talked about what it meant to, to be aired be Asian here in Toronto. Uh, as well, um, we also have to recognize when we have things happen that will have potentially a mental health effect on our um, employees. So uh, when we had that incident um, down in the States, we uh, the Atlanta incident, we did send an email out to all of our employees, helping them to understand that we have supports. 
Uh, when we did our mass campaign, we did it in 11 languages, and I will work very closely with my colleague, my colleague Kathleen and Deb Brown to make sure that we do more of that in the future. And we can provide the communication strategy at the end of 2021 for 2022 so everybody can be aware of what we're working on. Is that, is that good? Yeah, yep. thank you. Thank you for the answers. And just one uh, further question on that. Uh, I really appreciate all you do for the Asian Heritage Month, you know, about, about the, uh, uh, as you said, uh, safety the, of the drivers and customers are very important. I'm just wondering whether there are any anti-Asian racism incident on the TTC uh, in the recent months because, you know, of uh, how it has been happening quite often in different parts of, of the uh, of uh, of the world. Andrew Dixon, uh, could you uh, speak to that if you're aware of that? Yeah, I'm on the line. I don't have uh, any, any stats in front of me right now, but um, but we do um, try and document um, anything with that respect. So um, so I mean, I, I can dig and find it. Okay. okay, I'm just kind of wondering whether, you know, because we need to be proactive in uh, in helping, you know, to avoid all these incidents to become hate crimes. So I just kind of yeah, that, to be yeah. giving you a heads up on that. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So, so we do sort of keep an eye out for that because we do have conversations um, when we meet with our, our special constables. So we have their supervisors, they have parades that they have um, every morning. Um, where they show up and they sort of give them their marching orders on what's happening for the day. So when we do note that these incidents, especially that are happening worldwide, um, we do make sure that we mention it during those parades. So to keep an eye out for it, look out for that, right? Just be vigilant when it comes to anything like that. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. I don't have any other questions unless I'm missing somebody. Oh, Commissioner Min and Wong, you're up. Yeah, um, thank you. I did have a question with regard to the increasing in crime. I've been reading um, that on other transit authorities in North America, they've also noticed an increase in crime. And they've drawn a correlation between the increase in crime and lower ridership numbers. So my question is, is whether you feel that there's a correlation between the increase in crime and low ridership numbers, number one. And number two, because of the increase in crime, um, what are you gonna do about it? To you, Madam Chair, and that is the conversation that I had with TPS. Uh, it's the, the chief has confirmed to me that when he's dispatching his uh, police officers, he was gonna have them take the subway station to their locations, as well as all the vehicles that they have going into the bus terminal, stopping mid route when they say a wheel trans vehicle, uh, loading or unloading a vehicle, just to engage the conversations with our employees. It was real important that our employees see that they're, they're concerned and, and they feel for them. So that was the conversation there. Now, as for numbers in, in, in its entirety, you know, with ridership going down, uh, the numbers, actual numbers of incidents actually went up at the same time. Uh, so, you know, we knew that we had. Uh, uh, m some more mental health uh, issues within our stations with people uh, going into the stations. We've been fortunate that uh, last year during the budget process, the board approved additional constables, for instance. So those constables are now uh, being able to spend more time, the new constables, as they just came on, spending more time in the subway stations as well, working with streets from homes, having them participate with us so that we're there showing a lot more of, uh, due diligence and village vigilance being public in there. It's about that sense of security and safety and constant reinformation. So that's the approach that we've, we've been taking right now. So is it just, you know, your, you know that um, staff are, are, be, are being victims of this crime or are, um, are the uh, passengers also like, tell me a little bit about that is, is crime going up uh, for passengers as well? So I'll, if, I can, if I can address the first part, and then I'll ask uh, Andrew or, or uh, Betty if they have the second part. I've actually been pulling some uh, tapes myself to be seen, Jim Ross and I, to take a look at the assaults on board buses, for instance, and watching two or three people walk on a bus, right? And the operator sitting in his or her seat uh, and just the, the dialogue that was going back and forth. And with the, even with the barriers closed, people reaching around and taking a, a shot at our operator. It just... Um, 
where it's coming from, it, 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 the, this magnitude was just, it's just unacceptable. And that's what really initiated the phone call because we've been talking, many of us in the industry talk on a regular basis. And as you said, you've seen it elsewhere. Um, when it comes, let me see if, um, Kirsten, do you have it or does Betty have the, uh, when it comes to customers? Yeah, uh, on page, sorry, through the chair, on page 27 of the CEO report, you will see offenses against customers has also seen a dramatic spike um, in the pandemic. So we are seeing, um, you know, things like fights happening in the subway and so on. And of course, we uh, dispatch our supervisory staff, special constables and Toronto police to assist us with those. So we, we do see, you know, we do see an increase in these types of incidents in the system. I think working with Toronto Police, as Rick has reached out to Toronto Police, will be extremely helpful. Uh, the Streets to Homes initiative has been helpful. Number of contacts made there, um, you know, mental health issues are are prevalent. So that it's a multi-pronged approach, um, but you're not incorrect that there's been a spike. What percentage of the crimes that are being assaults that are being committed are assigned to mental mental health, and how many and you know how many are are not? Mental health related. So I'll let Andrew speak to that, but it's my understanding we do not characterize the actual events as whether or not they are mental health. The reason but, is mental health. So how can you say that you relate well, these crimes to mental health, yet you don't have any statistics? Can you help me with understand that? Yeah, I think, yes, yeah, so I think what we're saying is that the data is showing an increase in. Um, offenses against customers and offenses against our staff. And from our handling of those issues, we've noticed an increase of mental health issues in the system. But we don't correlate each individual event um, for a reason against uh, mental health issues, simply because we often don't know what, uh, what a person's uh, state of being might be in the instance. So your analysis saying that they're related to mental health are more anecdotal than, than Yes, you based know. on our experience, just based on our experience in the field. So, yes, I would say that's you just correct. think because you, you just think as opposed to knowing that these guys are, you know, they have. I mean, it's to say that that's the case. Shouldn't we have like. Reliable information where we actually can say that. Yeah, so if I can jump in, a lot of the um, any statistics we have with respect to the MTA, so if we're going to use that aspect, we do have um, statistics on that. But in general, right, uh, what we're finding is just because of the code of COVID effect, which is happening in general right across the world, um, individuals are, are sort of have a shorter fuse. Right, so with uh, respect to even like wearing a mask, whereas before you'd ask somebody to wear a mask and then they sort of, um, you know, they react in a more negative way than they would normally do. How many of these incidences are related to people not wearing masks? Yeah, I don't have the stats in front of me with respect to the wearing masks piece. But, but the fact that you, Madam Chair, through you, the fact that this, that, you know, that Mr. Dixon raises this as an interesting thing is that, you know, the increase in the, I mean, the conclusion that I come to from the answers that were being given is that there's been a substantial increase in, in assaults be, based on people not wanting to wear masks. Is that, is that what you're saying? No, that's just one small aspect. I, I was just giving you an example of one of the situations. So that we it's, find not, out there. it's not, it's not about crimes related to people getting angry because they don't want to wear masks. So what is it about COVID that means that there's been an increase in crime? You said there was, it's COVID related, and then you said masks, and then it's not masks. Then what is, tell me this COVID thing, how, how you say COVID is related to increase in crime. Because in, in respect to, yeah, so in respect to that, it's, it's uh, so the mask was just an example, but in respect to that is just in general, um, individuals would be able to go out and watch a movie, would be able to go out to a bar, would be able to go out to visit their friends and family, stuff like that, right? And that is not the, the case right now, right? With everybody being in lockdown, the individuals who take the system have to take the system either to go to work and different things like that. So when you're out in the system um, and you're dealing with all these issues on your person on personal fronts, 
it it uh, it has that uh, we call it a mental effect but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a mental issue but it does have a negative effect on individuals is this based on this is this is based on what like where do you get that from this is just based on uh, conversations that we've had with other agencies, right, right across the the U.S. With uh, when we speak to with APTA and CUDA, how every um, agency is sort of dealing with the with the the COVID and the responses that it's having with them. So it's based on on that. Okay, thanks, Madam Chair. You and I don't see any other questions. So we will move to, uh, or I'll ask if someone would move to receive uh, the CEO's report and presentation. Okay, Commissioner Lai. Madam Chair, Madam Chair oh, I want you I like have to a speak. Quirk? No, I'd like oh, to speak. Okay, I'm, my apologies. I didn't get any notification. Go ahead. Oh, I, I did send in an email, but anyways, I didn't. Well, I, I would be very, no problem. I would be very, Go very ahead. brief. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank the, the CEO for for the report. It's very uh, it's a nice report, and uh, uh, the the fact that you've done something for the Asian Heritage Month is really really applauding. And I really wanted to thank you for that. But uh, and also I think you're saying that uh, sometimes it's for the uh, for the employee of TTC. I think uh, for the customers quite important as well. I actually participated in a uh, in a town hall on May the twenty eighth hosted by the uh, university settlement. And uh, I really thank uh, TTC staff uh, to, they were there, Angela Gibson and uh, Michelle Cousins and Michelle and Michelle Jones, they're all there to answer questions. And, and you have no idea how much they appreciate the engagement. And we, I, I actually, they hosted it in Mandarin and that is the importance uh, of uh, of different languages because you know they feel like they is their mother tongue and they they can express better that way and we were actually the subject of the day was ttc fair policy and anti-asian racism so they did uh express some concerns about uh sometimes you know they, they don't feel that they are very safe or you know comfortable on the ttc because sometimes they don't speak the language and I, I think that uh, customers, the three types of most vulnerable customers for us at TTC is the new Canadians, uh, the first generation immigrants, and also the international students that are, that are taking the TTC. And, and some of them, you know, they don't feel as comfortable because there's language barrier and all that. It doesn't matter where they're from, you know, there's all, you know, we have international students coming all over the place. And it's very important that we will be very, you know, inclusive to them. And uh, that's why I usually, in the board meeting, I always stress upon multi-language and all that kind of thing. We, we need to make sure that they feel that they're not being discriminated upon and they, they feel that this is a very inclusive city for them as well. So I'd like to see that, uh, you know, in, in maybe future reports, maybe there's some incident about racism, whatever. I think it would be very important that uh, uh, that we know about it and how we can kind of work to prevent some of these things happening. And uh, it's a very, a very, very important piece to me. So having said that, I just wanted to thank uh, the TTC staff that was present at that uh, virtual town hall meetings. You have no idea how much appreciative that they have uh, for a commissioner uh, and the TTT staff to be reaching out to them and, and be, you know, and be listening to them and engaging them. And they're really very thankful for that. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Those are my remarks. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lai. Um, I don't see any other comments, anybody who wants to speak on this item. So now I will actually ask for a motion to receive the CEO's report and presentation. And uh, Commissioner Lai, you can have that honor because you're the Madam only Chair. one to speak on that item. So there you Thank go. Thank you. Thank you. And all in favor, opposed, that carries. Okay, we're gonna move now to item two, which is approving the minutes of the ACAT general monthly meeting for February 25th, 20, uh, March 25th, and April 29th. So I'd now like to invite our ACAT chair to come forward, um, Igor, to present the ACAT meetings. Minutes. 
Hi, hello, Igor. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Apologies for the, some of the background noise. Uh, hopefully, folks can hear me clearly. Um, thank you, Chair Robinson and Vice Chair Hilla Rentis. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, ACA has had a busy couple of weeks um, with many items being discussed. My first item is on the TTC website that I would like to report to you folks with. ACA has been working diligently with staff to ensure that the TTC's new website is as accessible as possible before uh, launching. We've been uh, working with staff to identify tension points and potential solutions. The TTC's uh, new website will be WCAG 2.0 compliant, and where possible, uh, we will be striving to exceed this standard. My second item um, relates to ACAT's work with the TTC staff on the operations and procedures that will govern the Eglinton Crosstown LRT as we get closer to completion, as well as strengthening the relationship between ACAT and Metrolinx on current and future transit projects. We've had several productive meetings with Metrolinx in the last several weeks, and I expect more to follow to work through various accessibility items. My third item that I'd like to highlight is the extensive and detailed work that has been done by staff, by TTC staff, specifically Loris Demito and Charlene Sharp on the procurement of the seven meter ProMaster. Apologies for the name pronunciations. As commissioners um, might be aware, ACAD endorsed this vehicle in December with a number of outstanding structural items. Since then, we've been working closely with staff to ensure that these next generation vehicles are even more accessible. We've been able to improve upon these outstanding items and elevate the standard of accessibility as it relates to call buttons and side ramp deployment indicators. Some upcoming initiatives that ACAT and TTC are working on is a safety campaign for wheel trans users and cyclists, especially as we expand the number of cycling lanes in our city and the nice weather brings out more people. I hope to have more information on this at the next board meeting and opportunities for commissioners to help in promoting and spreading the message to ensure safety for all members uh, of our communities. Finally, one last point. Um, I wanna echo the comments from the CEO and acknowledge the celebrations taking place to mark the TTC's 53rd subway station, Kiel Station's brand new elevators, ensuring another barrier-free option for customers. ACAT has been intimately involved in the easier access program. And I wanna thank the design review subcommittee of ACAT and TTC staff, Steve Stewart, the, pre the previous easier access project manager and Saeed Hamedi, the current Easier Access Project Manager, for their and their team's work with ACAT on ensuring we elevate the standards of accessibility with these new paths of travel. Thank you all for your time. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you very much, Igor. Is there any questions? Okay, it's a pretty clear presentation. Uh, and any speakers? Okay, thank you very much again for that presentation. And uh, I would like to request a motion to receive the ACAP minutes. Uh, Commissioner Bradford, all those in favor, opposed, that carries. We're gonna move on to our next item, which is Wheel Trans Transformation Program 2021. It's an update. And um, we have a four, at least four presentations or deputations. We also have a staff presentation, but deputations. So uh, to the clerk, would you like to, are you ready to go ahead with the deputations? Or would you like to do the staff presentation first? I just don't know where you are operationally. Hi, Chair, we do have the deputants in the meeting. We have two deputants on this item. The first is Adam Cohoon. He is ready to go. Okay, let's let's proceed. Hi, Adam. I, uh, yes, um, I would just like to say, that the, um I still have um some very big concerns on this on this issue. I've also sent in corresponding a letter of corresponding. First of all, the TTC uh, is the only service in Ontario that has used the family of services in this way to actually make um, transfers to um, vehicles other than buses. I know Ottawa does have the O train and some some other things, but T Toronto is the only one that's pushing fully ahead with multimodal 
and the subway is less equipped to be accessible now. Yes, you are opening more stations, and so, but there is less staff, and the only the only communication service that is underground is the yellow emergency pole pole things. There is no there is no blue accessible ability button like there are in many other cities, including Vancouver, to actually just talk to customer service or talk to anybody in transit control. It's and it might have actually saved you some of the problems from that issue you were talking about on the other item. Is if there was a if there was a blue button that people could press rather than an, a yellow emergency alarm, maybe there would be less um, al alerts on the subway because of emergency pull calls, and that could save both time and money. It's akin to if the police department said. Oh, we're going to shut down the 808-222 number, and any time you want to talk to the police, call 911. That's what you're doing. You have not given non-emergency customer service any priority on the subway system. Same on most of the streetcars. There is not an easy way to talk to the driver. So this is why more... A lot of individuals, especially legacy users, especially people like me that have used wheel drive for 20 plus years, are not really ready for the transition to the regular service. And with the moving of the guard to the, from the middle of the train to the back of the train, it has, it has caused even greater access, accessibility issues. So I really think you guys really have to rethink some of this mandatory screening and stuff because there are going to be people that actually fall through the cracks and are just going to end up having the isolated lives that they've already had for 18 months because the staff and community will not fill out the paperwork the right way to actually make it so they can use the wheel trend service they are actually probably should be using. And also, it's I've heard many horror stories of people that have had changes in their health because of life and Stuff. And then they tried to re. Yeah, um, they've they've had to wait six months to even get a proper reassessment of their needs and put in the proper category. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, um, we're going to move to our next deputant. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks. Our next deputy is Adina Levo from the Seniors Forum. Go ahead, Adina. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Adina Lebo, and I'm deputing on behalf of the Toronto Seniors Forum, which is the voice of seniors at City Hall. We're part of the new long-term care and senior services division, and our members provide input into the City of Toronto staff and council on issues that affect older Torontonians. The current seniors population, 60 or 50 plus, is estimated to be around 690,000 people and is expected to double over the next 10 to 15 years as baby boomer generation passes into older age. Toronto is part of the age-friendly city network in the World Health Organization, and our goal is to keep seniors active, engaged, and independent. And participating in life for as long as they possibly can in a new policy directive called Active Aging. What this means is over the next 10 to 15 years, hopefully, 
more and more seniors will be out on the streets with their canes, walkers, disability scooters, wheelchairs, participating in life, hopefully staying healthier and decreasing reliance on already uh, burdened health system. Um, along with these populations, we work with TTC riders and SILTS and CNIB uh, and many other organizations, but along with these populations, we also need to factor in the other, and this is the new COVID long haulers. Stats are showing about one in three people are suffering long-term effects of the disease. This is not the flu. This disease leaves people with disabling inflammations, brains, lungs, kidneys, joints, turning previously healthy people into people with special needs. And if we add them in over the next 10 to 15 years, we could have 40% of our population falling into special needs categories. I'm just afraid when I look at budgets and planning, I'm afraid the TTC and wheel trends is building a vision based on a budget and not the reality of a world we're living into. We're looking at immediate costs, immediate obstacles, making incremental changes, yes, but we're looking at the forest, we're not looking at the trees. Don't get me wrong, the idea of a family of services is a great idea in principle, and it will help to relieve pressure on wheel trends with the opening the door to include a wider variety of categories. But when I read 50% of Wheel-Trans users will be transitioned to conventional TTC and forced onto buses, streetcars, and subways that are not totally accessible at this point in time, it's scary. It's made even scarier, as you heard from Adam, when I searched the TTC site looking for demographics and information, who are the Wheel-Trans users? And I couldn't find any data. All I could find was an operating statistics that said seniors and registrants comprise the majority of customer service. So if both of those statements are true, then 50% of seniors are going to be thrown from unconditional to conditional service and onto a family of services which is not ready. Thinking rationally about this fact, old age comes with failing eyesight, mobility, cognitive uh, skills, and other diseases like cancer and heart disease that sap one's strength and energy. And the plan aims at looking to decrease door-to-door -door service instead of expanding door-to-door -door service. I see 50% of seniors choosing to stay at home and minimize their lives as a consequence of these actions. Medical experts say this leads to social isolation followed by depression, a decline in health. It transforms into illness and disease, longer hospital stays and home care, and we and our children will ultimately pay for all these health costs if we don't keep people out there and participating. Budgets are important, but building them on a false reality can be very dangerous. Currently, the TTC capital planning and operating budgets do not reflect the real reality we have here in Toronto and the future we're living into, where a senior's population and therefore a major demographic for wheel trends is doubling. And now I suggest that it's the time to start painting the true picture of what we will really need to change to an act of living to reduce our health care expenses. We will be better off in the long term as different levels of government see exactly the kind of bleak future we're living into. It may even be easier to get more money if the light shines on the real need and everyone sees how big the need will be. Maybe new monies will come and true change will be possible rather than a band-aid solution hyped up to be real change. In ending, just let me give you some stories of what we heard from those who have been transitioned. If, if you could please wrap up. Yeah, please. I just have one more paragraph. Many have told us they just don't have the energy or strength to climb the stairs or walk the distances from the subways to the buses and streetcars and then walk to the stops to their destination. Others have recounted experiences with buses and streetcars fraught with difficulties. They can't get up the stairs from the street, but they can get up from a raised sidewalk or they might not be able to find a seat or there's a traffic jam of prams and walkers and scooters in the aisle up front so people can't pass, they can't get on, and the ramp only works at the front door, which is where the jam occurs. And elevators and escalators are out of service and alternative accessibility procedures don't make any sense. Um, 
get back on the subway, go one station east, use their elevator or escalator who are working and take a bus or streetcar back to the station you need to go to get to the top level and get off in the first place. It's debilitating, debilitating for people with limited energy and ability. The family of service reclassification process uh, needs to recategorize and, and look and re-examine people who have been uh, classified conditional until all parts of the family of service network, the buses, street carts, and subway stations are all totally accessible and ready yeah. to accommodate more fragile passengers. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Today. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. We're going to move now to staff presentation, so I'll hand it over to staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, Dwayne Geddes, the head of Wheel Trans here with this presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This presentation is part of our annual update to the board on the Wheel Trans Transformation Program. And I'll just give a brief overview on the history of the program as it does span a number of years. We presented this, first presented this 10-year transformation program back to the board back uh, to the board back in 2016 as a way to transform and modernize wheel trends. And of course, the obvious questions were why and why now? Uh, and the answer is, well, there's several, several reasons. First and foremost, the TTC recognized that we need to do more on the accessibility front. We recognized that we needed to provide our customers with accessible transit service that ensures dignity, spontaneity, fairness, and freedom of travel so our customers can enjoy the benefits of public transit to the fullest. As well, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act introduced new legislative requirements that included expanded eligibility to people with disabilities beyond mobility impairments. This would mean more people would be, would be eligible to use Wheel-Trans and uh, that our forecasted demand would continue to grow. Another reason is that we wanted to ensure that we incorporated the City of Toronto Auditor General recommendations that include implementing a comprehensive plan for integrating wheel trans customers to the uh, accessible conventional transit system. Next slide, please. The vision of the program is to provide an accessible transit service that ensures dignity, spontaneity, fairness, and freedom of travel for all customers. And you will notice that the program aligns with five critical paths of the TTC's corporate plan including innovating for the long term through our scheduling and dispatch software upgrades, moving more customers more reliably through our family of services, and make taking public transit seamless with the introduction of our access hubs. Next slide, please. Providing support for our customers throughout this transition is extremely, extremely important. We recognize that this new model of providing service to our customers has led to some apprehension. Some customers have never used the conventional system and may not be comfortable making this change. This is why we've introduced our travel training program to assist with uh, assist our customers with this transition. This is personalized one on one training on how to navigate the TTC safely and independently. When we look at our customer profile, it is evident that the majority of our customers are over 60 and it has been important for us to tailor our messaging and support programs to be inclusive of their needs. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, access hubs are another key component of the transformation program. And in 2020, 14 more access hubs were completed to bring the total to 16 around the city. These hubs are spacious, have room for multiple mobility devices, have accessible doors, they are well lit and heated for added comfort during the winter months. Pictured here on this slide are two hubs, one in the daytime showing how spacious they are, and another one at night demonstrating how one looks when the lighting is activated. Next slide, please. This next slide uh, just shows a map of where the 16 hubs are located. Again, we received a lot of great feedback about these hubs, most, uh, with most customers letting us know how they appreciate the spacious design, lighting, and heating. We located these hubs near key high ridership bus routes to make the connection to our large and fully accessible bus service even easier. We know that our buses are the real workhorses of the TTC, so we strategically placed these hubs at major transfer points to take advantage of their use. Next slide. When we take a look at measuring the success of family services, the, the, the whole initiative and the program, we need to take a historical look at our ridership trends uh, leading up to the introduction of FOS. This slide uh, shows initial ridership projections over 10 years, starting in 2016 when we first presented to the board, and those projections are shown with the gray bars. Alongside those projections are actual ridership numbers from 2014 to present with the red bars. We see here that from 2014 to 2015, we saw a 12.5% increase in ridership year over year, which was the highest on record. 
And then another double digit increase in our ridership uh, of 10% in 2016 with similar growth projections expected for 2017 and beyond. With the expanded eligibility coming in 2017 and the prospect of unprecedented growth in the coming years, we knew introducing family of services was vital, vitally important to sustaining wheel trans services. So in 2017, we introduced the FOS pilot and continued our efforts to make our fleet and stations more accessible, all while promoting the concept of family of services to our customers. That year, we saw a reduction in our ridership growth for the first time in years. In 2018, the family of services was operationalized, and we started to see our desired results come to fruition with a relative flatlining in our ridership. We started to survey our customers just so we can get a better understanding of what percentage of our customers are using our accessible conventional service. So we contacted customers randomly and asked them, you know, how did they travel the day before? The last time you traveled, how did you travel? And on average, 20% of Wheeltrans customers told us they used our accessible conventional system. All of these signs point to early success of our family of services program. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, this transformation program is about modernizing and transforming the services we offer to our customers. This includes enabling our scheduling system, both online and through reservations, to book multimodal uh, trips, modified trips, and view trips up to 18 months. Throughout 2020, we have been piloting our mobile app with many of these customer-enhanced features. As we modernize and roll out new products, I want to highlight and recognize the importance of ACAT who have continue, uh, continue to provide valuable feedback to ensure the best possible product for our customers. Next slide. Fleet replacement is another important part of transforming wheel trends. And you heard the chair mention it earlier today, pictured on this slide, uh, both of the chair of ACAT, I should say, the both uh, both of our six meter and seven meter ProMaster vehicles are pictured here. These vehicles will be replacing our older friendly style vehicles and are much more fuel efficient, easier to maintain, and can access many more areas in the city uh, than our older vehicles. In 2020, we will we successfully completed the pilot of our 7-meter ProMaster with ACAT actively being involved. Uh, customers, operators, and the maintenance team were very impressed with this vehicle. At the end of 2020, 128 ProMaster vehicles were in service, and after a successful pilot, the 7-meter ProMaster uh, we received, of the 7-meter ProMaster, we received approval to purchase 90 of these minibuses. Next slide. And as we wrap up the presentation coming to an end here, we can't leave without talking about wait times. Uh, the reservation call center has been a long, has been a, a, an area of concern for a long time for our customers. And in fact, when I first joined the wheelchairs team back in uh, the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, long wait times was the number one complaint that I heard from customers. We knew that we couldn't truly be successful in transforming wheelchairs without taking a deep dive into the contact center. So we did. And we started looking at ways to be efficient, modern, and flexible, all while providing a high quality of service to our customers. This led to an overflow solution that was approved by the board in 2020 and implemented at the end of that year. Uh, since the implementation, we have seen a significant improvement in the abandonment weight, dropping from 29% down to 3%, and the average wait time dropping from 21 minutes down to 2. Next slide and last slide. Lastly, I'll conclude the presentation by touching on a few initiatives that we look forward to working on over the next year. We will continue to the mobile app, allowing even more customers to take part and offer feedback and suggestions. The TTC will continue on its journey to becoming fully accessible. We are excited that all buses, streetcars, and subways uh, are, are accessible, along with 52, now 53, as you heard from the CEO and the chair of ACAT, 53 with, with Keel on board are, are being accessible, 53 stations. All of this incredible work over the years has paved the way for us to continue to expand our family of services options for our customers and will help us achieve our vision of providing an accessible transit service that ensures dignity, spontaneity, fairness, and freedom of travel for all customers. Thank you very much. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Great presentation. Any questions on the presentation? Any speakers on this item? Okay, thank you again for that amazing presentation. Uh, Madam well Chair, oh. Madam Chair, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I, I just I just wanted to to, to make a comment. I, um, you know, what I got out of uh, the report, an excellent report, is that um, implementing family of services perhaps may be you know a little more complicated and take more time than than. Uh, we might have uh, thought in the very beginning, but the silver lining is that we are building um, a much more accessible, uh, responsive system to deal with 
um, a broader range of accessibility issues, including those uh, Ms. LeBeau mentioned, you know, as we all age, we can appreciate, I certainly appreciate it, some of the comments she was making about uh, about accessibility. Um, I also just want to take the opportunity to to just thank ACAT, um, uh, our, you know, our, our, our team, our management team members uh, did that, but I, I want to underline that. I think, you know, the, the through ACAT, we get invaluable advice and um, uh, the, uh, it, it, it is worth, it is worth a lot and it really is helping in the, in the process. And, um, you know, I, I know that uh, Mr. Gates, uh, attends all those meetings and takes notes and provides really good responses. So, uh, uh, let me, uh, let me just make that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would echo uh, the support and acknowledgement of ACAD and their participation and insights. Extremely helpful. So um, great report, great presentation. Well done. And uh, um, we are now, I'm now going to request a motion to adopt staff recommendations noted in the report. Uh, the vice chair is moving that. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. We're going to move. I think we talked about a one o'clock lunch, but we only have two items. So I'm assuming you want to charge ahead. Uh, the next item. Okay. Thumbs up. So SAP, uh, there's a brief presentation on this item. It's a, it's a great, it's a great presentation. Go ahead. Um, Josie. So thank you chair through the chair. Uh, good afternoon. So, as you just heard about transformation, uh, that's front facing. This presentation is really about some of the transformational work we're doing in the back office. Uh, our SAP program uh, is uh, obviously a modernization program, but it's actually a catalyst of transformation through the organization that uh, is enterprise wide and it does help advance uh, three of our key pillars of our corporate plan. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Michael Morier, our senior director uh, of SAP program delivery. And he's going to provide a presentation about the SAP program, uh, provides a bit of background, the progress that's made to date, and summarizes the next phases. And we're, we're presenting that today uh, really as backdrop to a report we're bringing forward in July, uh, which is the award of a contract for SAP time and attendance project. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be starting with the overview and update. Uh, next slide, please. We'd like to today to give you an overview and update of the program, uh, where it started, where it is today, and what we're planning for the future. Next slide, please. Like identified in our five-year corporate plan, the key is here to upgrade the back office processes. And those are our legacy processes, finance budget, human resources, payroll procurement, and materials management. The objectives of our program is to modernize those by re-engineering our legacy processes going back 30 and 50 years and building a platform that we could use in the future and grow and scale. In addition to that, using SAP as the core technology aligned with the City of Toronto direction. Next slide, please. The alignment to the corporate plan, as Josie mentioned, is those three key critical paths, transform for financial sustainability, enable our employees to succeed, as well as innovate for the long term. Through automation, digitization, we'll be able to achieve those critical path items, as well as enabling our employees to succeed with modern tools, which will enable us to work remotely as we are today. In addition to scalability and secure systems, seeing safety and security is our cornerstone. Next slide, please. The history of SAP, the TDC, is really based on the history of the city. City started with SAP in 1998. Following that, the AG made a recommendation in 2004 that there'll be an SAP first recommendations for the city as well as ABCs to leverage SAP when they're looking for an ERP. That came to the TDC in 2013. Following that direction, a business case was developed, a program budget established, and in 2014 and 15, an RFP was developed where the program kicked off with our vendor in 2016. Next slide, please. In March of 2016, we started off with our wave one, focusing on finance, HR, and payroll and benefits. And then shortly after that, around June 2017, the program had some issues. And there was an er external program vendor that was brought in, Ernest & Young, who looked at our issues, 
highlighting defects in our solution, uh, plans to achieve our go live in 2017, and saying, you know, there are some areas that you need to focus on. Let's take some action. The TDC then took action, worked with our program vendor for a recovery plan, but then found out that when e and Y came back in October of 2017, not, a, not enough action has been taken place with the vendor. And following that, uh, a report was provided to the Capital Projects and Procurement Working Group to approve a program reset and to bring the program under TDC leadership in-house under the CIO. Next slide, please. The reset outcome under the CIO's leadership resulted in an immediate go live in November 2017 with the TDC pension payroll and benefits moving to SAP from the mainframe. Following that, a year later, in November 2018, we went live with our core finance, employee payroll benefits for our 16,000 employees, and digitized, modernized the recruiting and onboarding along with that. We applied the ERI recommendations and lessons learned to rebaseline for our future phases. We also aligned our 2019 budget scope schedule with a revised phased approach and continued external program oversight services for the rest of the program. Next slide, please. The top five lessons learned coming out of the EY recommendation are in a few areas. Program and oversight and governance, where we would want to have less reliance on external consultants managing the program and to report directly into our project review board and continue with our strong project leadership and sponsorship. We want to improve our monitoring and reporting, which you are doing today since 2019, with strong dashboards that show scope, schedule, cost, and resource into issues and bring them up as we need to to our project sponsors and steering committees. We also are focusing on our resources that have to join the projects through secondments so we're properly staffed with experts on the team. And again, focusing on costing, highlighting our cost reports that show also delays, extensions, change requests, and everything around cost management. And finally, risks that come up during the project to properly have them mitigated and tracked during the implementation. Next slide, please. In summary, the transformation journey in payroll benefits, recruiting and onboarding, and the digitization, the key message here is we're moving from a mainframe that we didn't replace back in 1999 Y2K. Those combined with manual paper processes allow us to do the digital transformation as part of our corporate plan and to establish these new system of records and modern processes for our staff, bringing us closer, hopefully, to a paperless process as best we can. Next slide, please. The benefits realized to date following that implementation of Wave 1 allowed corporate finance to establish a brand new general chart of accounts following industry practices and modern reporting. Our talent management team are able to now recruit and onboard staff digitally instead of the paper-based process with allowing them to work from home during COVID. And our employee service center was a huge implementation implemented payroll for 16,000 employees, established a central MyTTC center of excellence to receive phone calls and inquiries from staff. To date, there's about 63,000 that have called in since 2018, either through an electronic ticket, phone call, or email. And that was the core focus of wave one. In accelerating and building off that foundation, <clears throat> we started in phase two, where we have corporate finance implementing the first part of accounts payable, reducing our doctor's note payments that we make by consolidating and eliminating the manual database that was used before. In phase two, we also implemented the MyTTC SAP Jam employee communication mobile app to improve again part of the corporate plan, our communication with our frontline staff, where they could look at their operator running crew guides, safety information, health information, and, and other information from the corporation through the frontline um, mobile app that we've developed. In addition to that, we've also implemented just recently in March, a new learning management system where we are able to now use that platform where we can integrate to WebEx and recently uh, have instructed through the City of Toronto, the confronting anti-Black racism class through our new platform, which we would not be able to do uh, with our old platform, which was 20 years old in replacement. Next slide, please. The realigned scope after learning many lessons from wave one and looking at business priorities and initiatives, you can see with the check marks that we went live with on many processes. We also accelerated, and you can see with the two green arrows, things we moved from originally planned wave three to wave one. But the key focus here is the realignment of phases two, three, and four, 
In addition to adding three projects with business scope aligned with the SAP first recommendation from the city of Toronto and not looking for other software. We also de-scoped capital and operating budgeting and real estate accounting aligned with the city of Toronto direction where they're moving forward with those initiatives. Next slide, please. The realign program today has the four phases. We completed wave one and now we're on wave phase two, focusing on time entry and attendance, which will be coming to the board in July. Learning is completed, the mobile apps completed, accounts payable is done. We're also focusing our costing initiative. And now phase three, we're focusing on our procurement transformation, as well as our asset accounting, employee engagement. And then finally in phase four, performance of compensation and our grievance management initiatives. Next slide, please. The program schedule summarizes where we have started from in 15 and what we're gonna be ending up by 2026. These are the timelines to date, and as we move forward plan, we will be refining this as we go. Next slide, please. The financial summary shows our budget, which was a total EFC completion of 272 million, revised from our original budget back in 2014 through lessons learned and realignment of our scope and schedule and what it takes to do with this modernization and transformation from what we've learned over the last implementation. We also highlight our software and hardware costs typical to manage a system like this in ongoing operating and sustainment activities, as well as our projections for our onward operating costs as we implement more down the road at a class four or five rough order magnitude estimate. Next slide, please. In summary, phase two, we've accomplished a significant amount of work during the pandemic with our launches, and most importantly, introducing the time and attendance RFP contract award which we are nearing negotiations uh, completion. Next slide, please. Phase two, a key killer, a key, key point of our time and attendance project, a large one, is a project that is replacing the 1970s mainframe system holding our time and attendance balances of our staff. We've learned from our lessons not to go live in a big bang way and therefore have put together three releases to launch our solution. We issued an RFP in May of 2020 for to purchase hardware and time clock devices, software and implementation services. We're nearing completion of that negotiation this week. And we in, in, and we have one successful component proponent who uh, is part of that negotiation. We also had introduced a fairness monitor for independent third party observation, which will all be brought to the board on the July 7th board meeting for the contract award. You can see our expected benefits again is to replace our mainframe system, our extensive paper based processes with savings illustrated in the operator scheduling area and the time entry process, which is very manual in nature with a lot of paper and data entry. We will be able to provide our management team as well as our employees with self serve functions of time and attendance, aligning to our collective bargaining agreement and providing absence over time and attendance management reporting through automation and digitization of those processes. Next slide, please. Phase three outlook again focuses on materials management, addressing auditor general recommendations on how to track and, and cost projects and materials. Employee engagement focuses on uh, analytics where we can survey our employees, especially it nowadays to find out uh, what they are doing, how they're feeling, and also about initiatives that we wanna do to gather their input and use that in proper planning as we move forward on these modernization initiatives, which we know affects all of our employees and address through change management and training. We also have an initiative to address our asset accounting where we will centralize all of our assets in the TDC so that we can meet legislative requirements and know that when we add and improve our assets through betterment or through the depreciation, we have those financial calculations so we could report that in an accurate way. Next slide, please. In closing, critical success criteria for this program includes continued executive sponsorship, which we have today since 2019 and the realignment. We had it before, but we have it much stronger today. And that ties back to also our project review board alignment. And we follow that governance model to support our project teams, because as we know with projects, things come up, but we need that escalation channel to really strengthen and support the project team whenever they need that. We wanna document our current processes or update the ones we have today filling in also our business requirements of what we need in the future, and then look at the technology and see if it'll deliver it. 
through our assessment phase, which is a very detailed planning initiative. We also want to focus on our business data and legacy processes that require transformation because it has been around for 20 or 30 years. And we also want to implement SAP without customizing it so that we can sustain it easily in the future. And most importantly, documenting the benefits that we spoke about earlier in all of the projects so we can measure our success of what we planned from our project charters. Next slide, please. And in closing for this to the chair and to the commissioners, we will be bringing the July uh, board report for the time and attendance award to initiate and kick off our modernization for that business process area. Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent report. I have a question from you for you from Commissioner Lai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very quick question. Uh, with all these capital investment, are we seeing any measurable savings as a result of the uh, SAP installation? Yes, we are seeing savings in the areas in three areas. We're seeing productivity gains, efficiency savings, as well as the digitization of our process through retirement of our legacy systems. So that's just in a nutshell. So we, we do have some savings there. I see. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. Thank you. So if I may, through the chair, uh, just to, to, to broaden that a little bit, uh, we've, uh, you know, we're establishing a benefits framework where we're trying to capture true efficiency savings, productivity gains, and any value added um, benefits uh, from each of these. And uh, the project has estimated values and then we be we were using that to then look at when we actually implement, you know, are we achieving that or not? So there's going to be a full program uh, made available here as part of the work that's that Michael's uh, overseeing that ensures that we identify, we monitor, we capture, and uh, and harvest those uh, those benefits, and then be able to report on those. That's very nice to know. It's very important that we can measure the savings. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dragio. Go ahead next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a quick comment and a question. So first, I, I am always encouraged by any organization that is using mainframes and backend processes that are older than I am. Um, and having that add uh, change. Uh, so I think I think this is perfect and. I, I, think, I think we can all certainly agree that back end modernization and digitalization is going to be the first step in which I'm sure is going to be a grander vision for innovation for the entirety of the DC. So I like this stuff. This stuff may be boring to some people, but I, I'm super encouraged by, 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 by all of this. Uh, my question, Michael, and, and, and what I've often seen in organizations especially when there, there certainly is one way of doing things, and if it's not broken, we shouldn't change anything, is how do we ensure that there is actually going to be adoption of these systems, right? And, and how do we ensure that there's no risk of any employees or staff members who may be indoctrinated in one way, shape, or form, who may not, or, or who may resist change like this? So one, do you think that there's any risk to that adoption? And if so, how, how from a people perspective, are we thinking about that? I think it's a it's a good question. Um, all projects that we implement and across the TDC, not even these types of projects, but I think anything, there's always going to be adoption challenges. There's always going to be some people who really like the old way and don't want to do the new way. That's through education. So through change management, and we have that part of our project, change management communication, we would socialize the concept of, hey, this is coming, you know, a year in advance, two years in advance, three years in advance and make sure that we target those stakeholders and ask them, what do they think about the new change coming? Now, some people will say, that's great, I can't wait. And some people say, I'm a little worried about it. What we wanna do is educate them and inform them and coach them to say, this is what's coming. We really need to do this because we need to get off the old one and we all need to be part of that. And through that coaching and socialization, education, informing them, people eventually will get there. And that's part of transformation and change. And it's one of the most difficult parts of modernization. It's not the technology, it is the people change. But I see in the organization, even the TDC going to let's say electric buses, the same kind of change took place. It's the modernization 
going that direction. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Vice chair is up next. Uh, thank you uh, chair. Um, kind of on the same theme. Um, uh, but, but a bit different, you know, th these projects. Uh, SAP is core to organizations today and, you know, where where we've all seen uh, issues is um, in in governance and then execution. And so really glad to see that uh, one of the major shifts and changes is to really put uh, greater attention on governance. Um, but I'd like to dig a little bit under the covers of that. What does that actually mean? And perhaps this is more a question to uh, our CEO and our operating officer, chief operating officer in that you know the the making governance work goes to the question of if I'm the executive sponsor, am I held accountable? Is it part of my annual objectives? Am I clear that delivery will determine whether or not I am judged successful in that position or not? And am I also doing my job by ensuring that that accountability is streamed through to the right people within my organization that does that has to get the work done, including one component, which you mentioned, which is communication education. That's one of them. Uh, but it's that, you know, what does that under the cover governance look like? Are you satisfied as the, you know, the lead on this, that the, uh, the pieces are all are all there um, and that it isn't just, you know, the emperor has no clothes event here. Uh, I can answer that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I'll take that, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair, and thank you for the setup on that that question. I'm very comfortable. You know, we've had these discussions internally about having people that have done it before to help bring people along. And with with uh, Michael, where he is, and his, he just gave a fabulous presentation. He's done this a number of times. He's instilled confidence in the organization. I am going to turn it over to Josie because, as you know, Josie's been leading this for us within the organization. Right with Michael uh, in her end lead, she can give you a little bit more of an explanation on how that governance is working throughout the system. Uh, thank you, Rick. So through the chair, uh, every pro so there's a in in this particular case, uh, as in our other major capital projects, we have an executive steering committee for the entire program. Um, it tends to be someone like myself and the chief people officer who have the kind of the core areas that we're implementing, but every project underneath the program has an, has also its own governance structure. So we have uh, people identified who are at the senior uh, levels who understand the business requirements, who also have an appreciation for the technology. And I think what's also very key to, to the other question that was around change management is that the people who are in the project are people who understand today what, what we do and are trying to understand what the new vision is of what we're trying to do tomorrow. Um, the governance also includes very uh, clear program management approaches and the overall program reports into our, uh, our project review board. And of course, you know, is then reviewed as part of the budget process as well. So um, a lot of clear accountabilities or the, the meetings, the way things are, are handled, all documented. Uh, understand risk, decisions are made, charters are updated, change orders are, are you know, uh, documented if necessary. Um, so there's a full on, uh, very disciplined approach to it. And the people who are leading it have the vision um, and, and steer it uh, so that we can uh, achieve those objectives. Thanks for that, Josie. And uh, speaking personally, you've got my permission to use an iron fist on that stuff. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I'll just say, uh, you know, uh, this was an excellent presentation and I, I do wonder though, even though you're working at lightning speed now, why, why all the delays? Like, why did it take so long? The city was doing this, I think, pre amalgamation, which I don't even want to guesstimate how long ago that was, but just, can you tell us why it's taken? Is so long to get here and we are here and you're fast tracking and I appreciate that, but I just wanted that, um, that, that feedback or the reasoning why. So, through the chair, I just want to clarify is the question why we didn't do a Y2K 
changeover? No, no, no. Sorry, uh, no. <laughs> Just why? Why SAP and and the TTC? It's it's been a long story in the making. So why? Just explain why that is. Why the some of the delays over the years? Okay, I don't have the history of why the TTC didn't start SAP earlier. But I do know that from when I, I did join the TDC and take on this initiative and lead the program, the planning and direction they're taking is very forward looking. In fact, that the direction that we've taken on the right ver version of SAP avoids an upgrade down the road because of that strategic vision that they had. And I and I believe that the you know, when we look back at where things didn't start earlier. Um, we've definitely caught up in that regard on going forward with SAP. As you know, these initiatives are not easy and the sequencing and alignment of them, things change. And now what we've done is taking that lessons learned and looking at how we're proceeding and making sure that we're proceeding in the right plan in the right sequence. Thank you very much. That's great. I don't see any other questions. Um, I don't know if there's speakers on this, but um, just a reminder, you can't move motions on an information report, not that you'd probably want to, but um, any speakers on this? I don't see any. Okay, I'll just say thank you to Michael and Josie. They've done an uh, incredible job on this. It is a monstrous exercise, a monstrous sized uh, undertaking. Uh, and they've just really, I would say, accelerated it um, since they've had their their hands wrapped around this. So it's really exciting to see. And um, I don't think any of us uh, wish ourselves in their capacities to do, to to take this on because it's such a uh, a mammoth undertaking, as I've said. So I thank you very much to staff. And I'll move to receive the item. All in favor? Opposed? That carries. All right, we are now on item nine, which is a financial update for the period ended May 1st, uh, 2021, and major projects. I'm going to um, pass it over to uh, Commissioner Osborne. You held this item. Do you have any questions for staff? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I do. I have one, uh, and it relates to something that we've been um, working, uh, a guideline we've been working under for some period of time that's uh, referenced on page five of the report. And that is that um, at 50% of pre-pandemic ridership, we will increase service levels to 100%. And we have been working under that for some time. And I expect, although I wouldn't say a thousand percent, but I'm pretty sure it was before we had a single vaccine in a single arm in this country. And so my question is, if we have had a look at this standard of service with experts, public health, others, to see if this is warranted, if it is correct. And you know, I note that while we are vaccinating, risk is still around. I, I'm just wondering if we have had a look at this to, to see if if this is uh, the way we should be going, because we're doing it obviously at great cost to the system. Um, so if warranted, that's great. I'd just like to know that we've checked this with the authorities. Through you, uh, through you, Chia. Uh, yes, we have. We've had a significant consultation with Toronto Public Health, but you may recall early on in the pandemic, many of us in the transit industry were doing surveys to our customers about when they would come back and what would bring them back. And we knew that 50% of customers were saying that as long as we were doing a good job keeping the vehicles clean and demonstrating the safety of their, their, uh, their own safety, that they would come back. And then 75% of the people said they would come back as long as they felt comfortable and there was enough room on vehicles. Okay, so what we would do, that's why back, I believe it was April of last year, it might have been May, I apologize. We chose that um, when we were downsizing and adjusting service to the 90, 90 and 85% level, we didn't go too far down, but at the same time, we were uh, making adjustments to where we go back. You might recall that earlier this year for the 2021 budget, we started out 101% of uh, bus service, but we brought it down to about 85, 83% of subway and streetcar service with the intent of scaling it back up later on this year. So the full intent of that is uh, ensuring customer comfort so they come back to the system to get us to that at least 75% range. 
Okay, uh, do you want to continue commissioner? Sorry, I just muted myself. Yes, that is all I, uh, I wanted to know on this one. Thank you. Okay, are there other questions on this item? Okay, I'll move to speakers, speakers on this item. Okay, I think that's it. So I'll ask for a motion to receive uh, for information. Commissioner Osborne is moving that item. And um, all in favor, opposed, that carries. And uh, that is it for item nine. We are now adjourned. We can all move a motion to adjourn. That was a great meeting, everyone. Thank you, very productive. Great reports and uh, presentations from staff. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Bye, Chair. everyone. Thank you.